Hello and welcome to, to this week's edition of the, the Friday Tactics Board, sponsored by Bazooka Goal. Uh, I've got, oh, I'm, I'm privileged, privileged today. About time, is Not that? only are we doing it live and face-to-face, -face, um, but I've got one of the best coaches I know, I think. Yeah, he's definitely up there. Who is it? This is a good friend of mine, uh, Mark Brees. I'll let him do a quick introduction on, on who he is and what he's done. How are you, Mark? I'm all right, fam. Good. 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 Thank Good you for having me. So, um, obviously, for the people who don't know me, I've um, been coaching a long time, nearly 17 years. Um, You're only 25, aren't you? Know? Yeah, I wish I was, mate. <laughs> yeah, it's that phase cream, isn't it? Um, so, 17 years, you know, worked with first team players, worked in the academy sector, worked abroad internationally, worked privately for myself. Um, just been really fortunate to, to, to have the journey I've had and to see so many players come through in different ways and be involved in football at all levels from playgrounds, grassroots, first team, um, academies, you know, seeing people come into academies and come all the way through and now some of them are some of the biggest players in the world, um, male and female. Um, yeah, you know, it's all we do, it's all we talk about, isn't it? Football yeah. and so it's nice to be able to finally have a chin wag with you. That's it, no, I say rather than on, rather than on the phone. Uh, so no, it's been good. I've, said, I've known you for a couple of years then now uh, and was attra attracted to some of the videos what I've seen you put out. I'm um, joking, you said the videos, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of them. And the, the technical detail you go into with whether it's a one to one or, or small groups, mm. um, and that for me is. I say that's why I hold, I hold in such high regard is you, you, you get the, the minor details right um, and push that. And push your enthusiasm is always a, always a good thing Try to see. And the content that you put out has is, is been brilliant. I've picked up some ideas and I always share it out. And we've done some good charity stuff yeah, last yeah, year during yeah, lockdown. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll probably touch on that as well in a bit. So, obviously, we do this chat every week um, with different people around the world. And we've done, you know, say from Peter Sturgis, Peter Prickett, local grassroots coaches, just getting their view on football in general, mm -hmm. um, but mainly then obviously about what we do with, with Bazooka Goal and the Free yeah. v Free. Um, so, what's first question then? What's your view on on small sided games? Um, small sided games for me are probably so undervalued um, in all sectors of football from children just starting to play to children in grassroots children in academies um children going into you know first team professional development style of football because i think 3v3 or even 4v4 which i've done a lot of um it's a constant game so you think about what players need to develop a big thing is repetition. So it's repetition of not just technique or uh, just playing minutes. It's about, you know, you can manipulate 3v3 games to get whatever outcome you want. So um, I think it's huge. And I think especially for the younger years, it should be played a lot more. Now, I also should say this. I also think first team players, um, players who are coming through, say, under 16s, 17s, 18s, 23s, should still get the opportunity to play because I think one thing in football, why have we all started to do it or why have we all been involved in it? It's been a big part of our life now. It's a big part of our life because we love having the ball at our feet. You know, let's have it right. And that's it, yeah. You don't play football to go on, on long runs, do you? Well, you know, you know and, and when it gets to 11 aside, you're looking at, what, one minute, two minutes of actually having the ball at your feet tops if you're a top player. You know, 3v3, 4v4, it's like... You know the amount of touches you get, the amount of opportunities you get to practice and to 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 try and and develop skill sets with and without the ball. You know, without the ball is important as well. So practicing defending is important. You know, um, also you know with three v threes, there's a lot of counter attack stuff so like three v twos. So three v twos attacking, you've got to know how to work and to react quick. But then three v two, if you're defending as the two. You've got to know how to manipulate a free. So there's tactics behind that, you know, which if children can start to think about the game early and get them opportunities to practice stuff like that, then when you get to 11 aside, basically you're playing on a segment of the pitch. 
and that segment of the pitch, you can manipulate that gain to replicate that segment of the pitch, depending on obviously the, the level of the coach and the knowledge of the coach and the experience. But overall, I think also just just the play, just play, you know. And and you know, one thing which you know I've started to get back doing a little bit is a bit of five aside, and I love it because you know why the ball's always in, it's constant, you know. And and you can be a bit streetwise with it, you know, play off the board and play out one two and. You know, it's craft, it's guile, and and for a lot of kids, you know, playing on big pitches, big open pitches, the ball goes off. The, probably seven minutes of the game gets wasted. More, I, I've, I've, done, I've, done, the, I've done the stats and watched yeah. watch some games, and you know, you're looking forty five percent plus. The ball is out of play, waiting for a throw in, waiting for a corner, waiting for a goal kick. It does it gets ridiculous, and they've done it a few years ago with the Premier League. And I think City were the best at 58 minutes. Yeah. And the lowest was in like 48. They can afford all the ball boys. Well, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, of the, they, even though they, they're the team that keeps the ball the most, yeah. it's still out of play over, over a third of the time. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, and going back then to the younger ones, we've got some kids now who play, and when they play 3v3, they're, they're, like, they're on it. Okay, the mind's focused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. When they then go to 5v5, we see them, they drift off, they drift out the game, they look at the clouds, they see the mum on the side, everything distracts yeah, yeah. them because they're not like, involved in the it's game. Engagement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we take one kid from one environment, put him in another, and he's like, oh, he's not a good player. Then. And it's like, oh, it's not him, it's that environment then. Mm. And I think that's what we try to create with our 3v3 UK projects, is having that right environment for for kids to develop in. Yeah. Um, and it's a side that, <coughs> you know, we don't look at, we always look at, oh, it's all, you know, you, you more time on the ball, and you've got a more one one v ones but that actual engagement of, of the player, you know, especially then some kids that might have some, you know, some special needs, they're engaged and, and they're involved constantly. I think a good thing for smaller sided games though is it doesn't matter what level you're at, you're always going to get repetition, repetition of, um, failure so the opportunity to, to, to improve and learn and learn and learn because the ball's always in but then also for success and to measure success so if someone's finding it really easy playing a certain way in 3v3 or 4v4 you know the coach on the sideline I'm not saying dictates what the player does but you can manipulate them by come and play on the left side of the pitch so you're working on your left foot more if you're absolutely destroying someone on the right well do you know what go to the other side of the pitch so you can still play the game and you could have someone who's probably not as experienced in football playing with someone who's very experienced, but you can level it out by giving them challenges and, and go back to like the key bit, what I said before, it's about repetition, repetition, touches on the ball, opportunities to practice certain uh, phases or certain aspects of the game as much as possible without being stopped. You know, that's a big thing. So as a... A one on one coach, and you'll work on then you know, individual, you know, a, a technique then with a, with a player, mm. right? And then it's no, okay, go and try it now in, in your match. And they might only get two or three instances then in the game to, to put that into, into practice. Yeah. And like you said, it's just that rep repetition then where if, if they play a, a smaller game, that instead of having two or three chances and failing two twice, and then the third time going, I can't do that again. You know, it's messed up already. Yeah. Uh, and it's always in the back of my mind. And I've had that with, with adults saying that to me. Is uh, I get I get I'm back on the ball in ten seconds later, so I can go again. I've not got time to. But it's to like, well it's, like it's, it's like you know over the years you look at some of the best players, and you look at like um, big things to so split the game into four. Yeah, technical, tactical, physical, psychological. Everyone knows that. Like who's around the game or studying the game. Now you know. Every time you play a game, you know, sometimes when, when, say, I used to coach at the clubs or when I used to do the teams and, and or even, like, the women's first team at City, yeah, some days your focus would be psychological and it could be around resilience of making mistakes. It could be around reaction times. How quick do you react when you make a mistake? You know, do you make the game where they have to make a mistake before they can score a goal? You know, because what you find is some players are that resilient and tough some people go, oh, I don't need to work on that. But then there's always somebody out there who will match you and will be sharper, quicker with the mind, faster with the feet, 
So it's nothing what you can take for granted to go back to what you're saying there. You know, the repetition of success and failure is massive. The other bit is is how people deal with that on the pitch. Now, like five aside, say adults or three aside, you know, some of the people might not play for a long time. They know what they want to do. But other things in life, their mind's really sharp. But you get on that football pitch, some people can be the most academic people in the world, bankers, accountants, you know, solicitors, lawyers, you know, who, who academically might have gone to bloody Harvard or somewhere like that. And you get them on a football pitch, but because you don't have that football understanding, it's an education in itself. Because you've got to be educated to be streetwise when you play football. I don't care what you say. And it's about being that position and understanding that position. And if you're clever, the best players will manipulate you psychologically before you've even kicked a ball. So it's... And it, going back to some of the players then that, that you've coached, I don't know, obviously, you know, um, Foden then was, was a, a big one then coming through. And the story, he's always, he's always had a ball. Whenever he went, he could play football on the yeah. street. And you see videos of him when he was just breaking at the first team, still going out on, on the street yeah. playing, playing with his mates. Yeah. Uh, and you, you watch players like that and everyone you know, adores him now and what he can do with a ball. And you think that it's that, that street football that you say, yeah, he's, he's got that in him. You know, it's the love of the game, mate. Simple as that. You know, you look at the best players. I look at like the players what I played with even when I was younger. Never mind like Phil now. But the best players always had a ball at their feet. They used to go to the shop with a ball. They'd sneak a ball to school. If they wouldn't get a ball at school, they'd nick a basketball and use it as a football. They'd take a tennis ball in. You know, if it rolled, you'd kick it. You know, if if you could do a keepy up or something, you'd challenge someone to do it with you. You know. Um, but, the, but, you know, you're talking about Phil Foden. It's only a couple of weeks ago I seen him. And, and, you know, what I'd say to you is, you know, his talent isn't, he's not born with that talent. Yeah. That dedication and love to get better and, and, and to be the best player he could be has always been there. And, you know, go back to, like, the small-sided games, the fuck talking about. There's a great example of a player who physically was tiny, yeah, you look on social media, there's loads of footage from when he was in tournaments and stuff like that. Now, I'm not the only coach in the world who's worked with Phil. There's a lot of people who've played a big part in Phil's career. I'll tell you that now. One or two especially. But one thing what I'd say is, is you know, we all have biases as coaches. And one thing for me is, you know, technically I always love to practice with two feet. I always love to learn a skill. I also love to, like, be competitive to show people how good I was, you know. And he was very much like that, a challenger could be one touch, keep it up. It could be how many around the world can you do. It could be how many times can you whip that wall from 30 yards out on your weak foot. Now, some players, that's not their skill set. So if you go, let's do 1v1s and I'm good at defending. Well, come on, let's do 1v1, I'm good at defending. But if you say, right, it's 1v1s and I want you to attack, you might not score any goals, but they'll stop them all. So we all have biases as players. And when you're a player and you become a coach, I think that bias comes with you. So naturally, players like Phil or Brahim Diaz or... E. Capozo, who's flying about, or Tommy Waddell for sure, who's now at Watford, um, Marco Lopez, all these type of players. You know, I was attracted to them because they were very similar to me yeah. as kids. And it wasn't just that, it's the work rate and it, it, it's how much they wanted to practice. They were the people who you had to hide the footballs from because they were doing too much, but they didn't know they were doing too much. They just thought they were getting better. But go back to Phil, you know, he was the smallest player, I'd say, for four or five years, you know, and, and you'll see in the leagues what you have. I see it with my little boy now, seven, playing against lads who are this big and twice his weight and size. And, and, you know, he's not got that understanding like Phil, no way near, you know, he's no way near that level yet, but he loves it. And But Phil was always the smartest because he might get done in the first five minutes of the game, but then he won't get done again because he'd just play after player and go back to like, understanding how to get away from playing a 2v1 or a 1v1. His positional change on the pitch or how he moved to get the ball changed or he'd just be so unpredictable you just didn't know which way he was going to go because he was blessed because he loved practicing. He loved practicing. You know, if you did 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s, 11v11s, it'd still work at the same mindset and the same um, rate. But, but some players because they're not very good at, or they don't like it or they know they, they need to do a lot of improving. They try and shy away from doing the small stuff because it's quite react. you've got to be quite reactive as well as 
being forward thinking, you get this much time to think in comparison to get this much time to think. Now, if you've been in that situation where you're on a smaller pitch, like futsal, you know, 3v3s, 4v4s, 5v5s, your thinking process needs to be fast, but you still need to be calm. Whereas some players, when they've not been in them environments, when they're on level 11, they're calm, they look composed on the ball. When you get them into 3v3, they look erratic, and they look like they're rushing, they look scared, the ball bounces off them because they've not done all the preparation before they get the ball. Whereas people like, say, Phil, yeah, he's always moving. You know, the ball goes off for a throw in, his feet are still going like this. Some people stand there with their hands on the waist, his feet are moving, and his head like that, like a radar. What's going on? Where is everyone? What can they do next? And that's what, for me, the small sided games is massive because it keeps people's minds ticking. The best players are always thinking, what can I do? Where can I get? If I stand this side of the player, I can get around him or I could get around him and come in. You know, and, and some players just react. They get the ball and they react. Mm. So going back to what you're saying with Phil, you know, it would have been a dream to see a 3v3 or 4v4 because you just wouldn't know what's coming next. Oh, it is. And we'll, we'll pick your dream team later on. But just on some you said there, and it, I've been doing the 3v3 now for, for five years, and some of the kids didn't enjoy it. Yeah. And it baffled me. And, and I was I'm not I was upset why you know, I want every kid to, to go away loving yeah. what, what we've done and, and most do. But even if it was just one, it's like why, you know, why didn't he enjoy it, this kid? And it was that totally out of his comfort zone, forced into a small area to think quick. To not rely on his, his power and pace. And I, little kids, you know, whizzing around him. Mm. And he was, he was lost. And it was because, yeah, it, it, was, it was the environment that was different to him. And if they come and, and went back and go, right, okay, let me work work on this. Where I'm going, I don't like it. I'm never going to play it again. We've got some now in, in the league. Don't want to play futsal. Like, what? what? Mm. You know? Sometimes, like, like, is that the coach? Yeah. Out of his comfort zone, saying it. Oh, well, I used, have, kids I, I, it. I used to have um, heated discussions with people around small sided games and, and the purpose for them as they got older. So you've got to think about the game when you're younger, you're playing on smaller pitches anyway. Now, it's like learning anything in life a language, an instrument, you know, a skill set. You have to really be intensive and dedicated to it to improve at it. And you've got to be thinking about it constantly and assessing it. And you've also like got to have an open mind of to get better. I need to think about this, this, and this. Now, some people in life, you know, um, there's some fantastic footballers who become unbelievable coaches. There's some fast, fantastic footballers who, you know, haven't got the skill set to communicate or have an understanding of how to talk to players, not people, because it's completely different having a conversation with an adult than it is having with a child or with someone in a in a heated fast-paced, uh, competitive environment. Because if you come across too boisterous, you're going to get someone's back up. And, and, you know, one thing what I used to say was when you get to, like, say, under 13s, 14s, 15 16s, you get to 11 aside. Well, small-sided games could be, like, combination play in the middle of the pitch. That could be your focus. So you might just do 3v3s with your midfielders. Yeah. It could be, like, you know, uh, your small spider games is, is, you know, instead of playing the pitch that way, you might play it this way. So you're playing across, which is like centre-backs playing out. Yeah, so you can manipulate the game, but you got to remember that the highest level of football, you're being pressed. So you've got to get used to that intensity of playing. Now, it's also how do you recreate, you know, them, them 3v3 or them 4v4 moments in the game, which are realistic and... and I think small sided games helps because it comes back down to again the best players are the best learners. The best players who are under eight, if they're not the best learner, no one's gonna know about them under eighteen. You look at how many players now are getting signed later who've not been in a system, it's because the pennies dropped later, but they've not given up, they've kept going. But if they wouldn't have been doing small sided games, you know, technical work, um, studying the game. It all comes down to, for me, the players' willingness to learn, willingness to work, and willingness to like wanting to improve. Wanting to improve, improve means you're gonna make mistakes, and you're gonna make things tough for yourself at times because you might try things in the wrong areas of the pitch, especially at young ages. But it's having that understanding, and um, you know, 
I think going back to what you were saying before, it, you know, even older players should still play small sided games because you know what? There's nothing better than having a bit of a Raz. We used to call it a Raz. Mm-hmm. You know, the women's first team we go, can we play uh, 5v5? You play two tight pitches with little goals. The intensity used to go through the roof. You know, sometimes, you know, when they're a bit leggy, you're like, how can we get the best out of them there? Because they've done a lot of running. They've done a lot of high speed running or high intensity running. Do you know what? Sometimes, just let them play. Let them play. And do you know what? It's that one where we used to go two pitches. You'd have two pitches, 5v5 or 4v4 or even 3v3. And we'll call this one, say, the Dog and Duck. And we'll call this one the Etihad or Wembley. Yeah? If you win, you get promoted. If you lose, you go down. Now, if you play small-sided games for three minutes, yeah, winners move up, losers go down, that three minutes is intense. Players are doing defending, attacking, forward runs, recovery runs. You know, you actually see who's brave enough to put the body on the line every now and again. That's with kids and with adults. Now, the coach really is just setting a platform up there and the kids embrace it or the players embrace it. So, go back to what you say. I think it's, I think it's imperative that people play like that. No, is that I had that little competitive edge, like say free. We've done it, and like our tournaments are six or eight minutes long. And they go, ah, oh, that's nothing. I go, yeah, trust me. Yeah. It gets. Wait till wait till you see him play, uh, and you'll be begging for for the break. Um, and it is that is yeah by putting that restrictions out. Okay, you you can walk around now for half the game. Get found out. out. Yeah, yeah. Get found out. And it was when I went to the, the Futsal World Cup a couple of years ago, and you see the constant four minutes on, four minutes off. Yeah, constantly swapping the whole team. And it's like, yeah, because then top level players, yeah, four minutes was deemed to be the max they could give uh, at their, you know, at their, that intense level. Mm-hmm. And yeah, be swapping on, when, and, uh, on and off. When, when, you know, listen, I mean, we still do it now, so I'm not talking out of turn, but. We used to do a lot of like 4v4, 5v5 tours with kids at City. And then, you know, when you played, say, um, the Germans, Bayern Munich, Bayer Leverkusen, Borussia Dortmund, Schalke, teams like that, they would bring, say, 12 players. And within a game of 10 minutes, every three minutes, there's four new players coming on the pitch. Now, they were brave enough. You know, they used to win a lot of tournaments as well. It's not about the winning, but... It shows level and understanding and learning, you know, depending on what you're doing. But they could literally play 3v3, 4v4 and change a player for a player. So you wouldn't be changing a player in someone's, like, weaker. Because even though it's 3v3 and it's quite reactive at times, you've got to think on your feet. There's also a big tactical part in it, how you set up, you know, the player's understanding. Because the game's that frantic um, at the highest level, like... You, <laughs> You know, play, if you think about Premier League players now, Oli Solskjaer or Pep, you know, he might throw his hands in the air, but no disrespect. No one can hear what he's saying. Yeah, so that passion's there. But sometimes it's a pointless, like, waste of energy because when the players cross the white line, all your work should have been done. So, so they should have that understanding of what to do with the ball, without the ball, in this scenario, if you go 2-0 up and it's a short time game, you maybe think about blocking or you think about how you win the ball back. You're not going to start pressing and committing. And, and you know, with the 3v3 and the 4v4 stuff, what I'm saying in Germany was, they really honed in on the tactical stuff because it was transitions. So because you could be attacking within a five-minute game, you might attack 15 times, but defend 17 times. So you might have to defend when the ball's next to you or you might have to make a recovery run because your mate's been smashed on the top of the pitch. So there's so much tactical understanding in it, which, you know, it comes down to the players, are they willing to learn it? It comes down to the level of the players as well, because some people might just enjoy playing it. But you, no matter what the level, you can drip that in. It's a method, isn't it? You know? And something you said there, there's no coach the other week said it about, about transitions, 3v3, it's always, you're just constantly in transition. Yeah, attack, defence, attack, defence. It's just, it's that. That repetition again it's come up ten times already yeah. that same word uh, and it is that you you get all that and then I said to him I said what watch these players now go into the the five v five or the seven v seven game with the team and see is it transferable yeah. um, and after just a few weeks I see it kicking after one session you know it's transferable straight away into there I remember like so Ruben when he started football we went to 
wherever we went to this so one. So, Ruby, no, you'll actually, there's a Ruby Joe lad now. Nice one, yeah, yeah. Under seven. Under seven. Just under, under eight now. Oh, yeah, right, right. Eight. Yeah, Jesus, yeah. Hey, yeah. He's, he's, he's past it. Know. He's getting old. Bigger than me now. That's not hard, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, he just started his, his footballing journey. Yeah, yeah. And I see he's love, he loves football, doesn't he? Loves it. Um, but, yeah, so what's what's he doing then now? So, so. And then I'll ask you what, what type of uh, dad you are as well. Do you know what? It's massive because. So where he's at is he plays for a little grassroots team um, called East Manchester Galaxy, and you know I say this respectfully like there's two dads who've got uh, sorry there's one dad and, and one other guy who comes in and they're so committed to what they do they're there you know every Tuesday night you set them up they're learning as they're going along as well you know the kids absolutely love them like I can't tell you the the the. The relationship what they have and the kids come running in do you know what i mean mm. now there's a bit of a mix in the ability in the team but you know what from when i seen them i had a bit of time away where i didn't get to see him for whatever reasons with work and life and stuff and uh you know went back to see him and the improvement and the concentration and the understanding and that was through not being coached heavily just through playing football and being in a little bit of an organized environment um so what I do with Ruben is, is obviously I'm his dad. So um, if it's me and his mates on the park, you know, we'll do a bit, we'll go on the park, not make it formal, it'll be like, but but he's, he's, he's the opposite of me in the fact that he's willing to head it for a start, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> loves defending, loves defending. I'll do it because I have to do it. Um, and he's, he's grasping now that, that learning process, I need to keep working on, repeating actions to be able to do it in a game and it's like there's nothing better I think as a coach when you're working with someone for a period of time and you you know it could be finishing or it could be passing receiving practice and that little moment of what you've been working on they see it and they spin round and they go like that and you go like that to them right but when it's your own kit yeah and they go like that right and I'm going don't be cocky get on with it like that yeah it's 10 times better because do you know what it, it's just people don't probably realize how much football you know socially psychologically mentally you know confidence wise what it gives to these kids and and to be in these environments where you've got someone who's who's guiding them and supporting them and, and looking after them from a welfare point of view is massive but he loves it he loves it he's 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 a diehard blue so I'll tell you a story. So obviously I was at City. Then I left City. I'm driving out the gate the week before. I went to Old Trafford. Got him all the tracksuits, the goalie kits, the lot. And um, Sterling gave him a signed shirt. And the girls, all the girls gave him a shirt. So he's gone out. He's got Sterling top on and half signed. He's got the and they're down to his knees down here by the way. But he's buzzing. He's got mm -hmm. a City out on what's coming down here. Goalie gloves are right out here. And uh, we get to the gate. And Daddy, what tie something? I said, what you know. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking <laughs> hey, are you sure? Like, are you sure? But he loves it. He loves it. And, you know, he's obsessed and he's been lucky to meet quite a few of the players through people, you know, I've dealt with and stuff. But he's he's a good learner. Um, he's very competitive. He's just got to understand, like most under six, seven, eights, it's tactics, isn't it? Where you need to be when you have the ball, where you need to be when you don't have the ball. If you make a mistake, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, and I'm just trying to be a dad. I'm trying to be a dad. And Is that hard then? I, when, I, it was know. at first. It was at first because I think, you know, when you when you used to being on the sideline and when you say something, someone does it. Or, or, no, take that back. When you say something, someone thinks about what you're saying and either uses it or goes, I'll choose to use that at the right time. You want the best for your kids, everyone does, no matter whether you're a first team manager or you're just taking your kids to football every week or gymnastics or whatever sport. And, and you know, I think it's changed me massively because I've always cared and thought about how kids think, you know, in the process over the years and tried to pitch my messages and the way I talk and when I talk to them because you can have moments where they may be a little bit frustrated or down, you know, so you don't want to do that in a group. So I've had to do it as a parent because some parents have no filter, as you'll know. And, and, and you know, I've still, you know, at City, I remember once when Ruben was a baby and we just threw him in, like, under five, going out the go with the little ones. 
They have a clue what he's doing, mate. He was running around like Sonic. Like, I'm going, oh my God, this is embarrassing. But like, do you know what? He just loved it being around the kids and that was his first thing. It wasn't even the football, it was the social thing. What what got him engaged in football. And he loved wearing a kit and pulled his socks up and every night he'd make like a little man and put his boots and shin pads over his mm. socks for, you know, so his kit's ready. And I was sat in the stands and, and you know, these kids are babies. You know, even players who've been at academies for seven, eight years, doesn't mean you're going to become a footballer. You know, if you try your hardest and you give everything you can, you know, there's, there's football clubs all over the world. Now, it's over when you give up. Yeah, I always say that to people, but you've got to have some ability. You can't just be, like, thinking that you're at this level and you're here. You have to be honest, and the parents need to be honest. But at a young age, you know, as well as, you know, one thing what I push with Ruben is, you're always respectful to your teammates and your opposition and to your coach. But you should be the hardest worker. So one thing what I love about him is even when the coach is like talking and say in the middle of a session, he's still on his toes, which is massive because that's come from me. Like toes, 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 toes. Come on, you've got to keep your feet moving. You've got to keep adjusting. You've always got to be first to react. So he's doing that. And I don't any more than that, really. You know, and what will be, will be. Um, there's players out there who didn't take football service till they were 14, 15. You know, Mares, 20, 21, you know, still playing to play, paying to play football, paying subs to play. You know, the, the, there's players out there which, you know, could have been footballers, but maybe just lost interest. And a big part of that is, is are they enjoying it? Because there's players who are talented who aren't playing football, who should be playing football. It comes down to coaching, comes down to how they're being coached, what they're doing, content training. Um, and you know what? How many games do you play? Because you don't want to play. If you always, you know, big thing was, if you rock up every week and you know you're starting, you feel a million dollars. But if you know you're going to be on the bench, it's a bit demoralising. So it's, it's if you do well, you get that chance, you know, as you get older. But at younger years, the more they can play, the more they develop. The best kid at under eight isn't the best kid at under 12. I, I've seen it. So they were, they were nice someone and, and the last seven years, the kids I've known, who were the under six, under seven, the best around. By the time they're, they're 12, like they're, they're even not in the academy system, or they're just one, one of the players, everyone's caught them up. So it, was a, it was a stat, and they made it sound like it was a positive stat, and it's, well, you can look at stats anyway, can't you? And it was <coughs> over 50% of the players who turned pro were in the academy system before they were under 10. Mm. And it's like, oh great, that sounds good, but that also means 50% weren't. Yeah. yeah? So like you say about these, these late developers, and I'm seeing it now with, with my lad, He's now at 11 a side. Different game. Physically, it's massive. Yeah, yeah. completely different. Uh, he's, he's playing that. And so he's adjusting. Uh, and it's, we were talking the other day with, with the league. It's we go from 5v5, 7v7, 9v9. Like, and we rush. Like, some people are now going into next year's under nines in September. So they're under eights currently. Looking for 7v7 friendlies mm. to get us ready. It's like... And they've already just come into yeah. into this new format. Stop rushing, everyone's rushing to get to that 11, 11 a side. I think, I think one of the hardest things for, like, say, grassroots or even even academies is game time so important. And, and, you know, training is just as valuable as games. Don't forget that. Like, people just see the games as that's, like, the figurehead of what they're doing. Well, it is, but at some of the biggest clubs, you got to remember, you probably got some of the best potential players against the best potential players. So training could be more valuable than playing matches against players who might not be as able at the time or currently at the minute aren't ahead as some of the other players. And, and you know, it's about having an open mindset. And, you know, I speak with people all the time. I get phone calls all the time, you know, from first team players to just parents who, who I've known for years and I'll always be on the end of the phone for them. And I always try and guide people, not for them, but for the kid or for the player. So, because sometimes as, as parents, some people, you know, you could be on this side of the pitch and the coach on that side of the pitch. And the 11 11, the big pitches, windy days. You don't know what that player's been asked to do. So go back to like your 3v3 stuff. You know, you might say, look, I want you to get on the ball as much as you can on your left foot. Now, if that player's hardly played with his left foot, he's going to lose the ball. Because he's trying to do what the coach is encouraging him to do. Because he's trying to develop him. And it's like the same thing what I say when you have the ball at your feet. 
yeah? You shouldn't be looking like here. You should be looking there. If you're looking there, you can still look there and there. But if you look here, you're not gonna be able to get your head up. So it's the same with like development. Look at 18, 19, where they need to be and what they need to be doing. Stop looking at 9, 10, 11 and going, or under 6, 7, 8, and going, oh, we've lost the game because Johnny's trying to take it on his left foot. Why do you take it on his right foot? It's really good on his right. Because the kid's trying to get better. Yeah, and, and this is where like, I don't think the coaches should have to explain themselves as much as probably what they do. I've seen it on them grassroots pitches where parents are destroying these managers who are giving the time up, who are, you know, A, investing their own time and money to develop themselves to do something for free. They've not had like the privilege of being paid, you know, to focus on a career of that is what you're focusing on all your life. You know, they've got bills to pay, they've got other kids, they've got businesses to run. They've got other kids to take to other activities, so they're squeezing what they can into doing the best. And the key bit for me is, is you've got support coach, and you know that coach is putting time and effort into it. Some coaches may put more time and effort into it, but it's you know, people think it's easy being on the other side of that pitch. You know, everyone's an expert, aren't they? Well, I would say they've watched match of the day. Yeah, they've seen Gary Neville on Monday Night Football. I'm thinking, oh, I can do that. It's like, oh, there you go. There's your tactics board. Oh, I can't do that. It's like, well, shut up then and let, 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 let the guy... The key one for me, and I was explaining this to someone, to a guy who's the first team coach at Gank, like, a couple of days ago, and uh, it's called Michelle Ribeiro, right? And we're talking about now, which is great, there's so many people getting into coaching, there's so many young coaches who are now aspiring to run their own businesses and stuff. But the key bit is, what you've got to remember is, is, you know, um, say myself, I gave up running a coaching business to become the best coach I could be, which, you know, financially I lost money. Um, but I was one that put the time and effort in because I wanted to learn. And I knew I was, I was half decent, but then I wanted to be 10 times better than what I was. You know, in working with some of the coaches I've worked with, say Scott Sellers, who's now at Wolves, was a massive one for me tactically, just opening my mind up to another level of tactical knowledge, you know. And then you've got Rodolfo Burrell now who's the assistant manager with Pep who's another level of tactical knowledge again around transitions and stuff like that. But, you know, without that journey of me making that choice, I wouldn't have the knowledge I have. So my message is, is more, you know, don't just stay on the wheel, you know, you know, t take a loss to gain more because knowledge is power and, and you don't need 50 mannequins. You know, it's important you have all the equipment and stuff, but you've also got to understand why are you doing something and why are you repeating an action? Because everything you do in the game, there's a tactical outcome from running, passing, shooting, dribbling, even just changing direction. There's a thought process to it. Why are you doing it? What's the benefit of it? What part of the game is it? And that's where like learning and go to develop yourself and maybe, you know, stuff like this now, getting people who've been in the game is listening to how people talk and how they break the game down because I look back 10 years ago and I'm that young lad, you know, I'm not bad, I've got good feet, you know, I'll do some sessions, I've got these players and that players. And I look back now and I go, oh my God, I didn't know nothing. Like, I didn't know, I knew a bit and, and I was great with the kids and great with the players, but footballing wise, I didn't know nothing. Like, if I look now what I know, being out of the game full time for a, the period I have, I've learned more. Right. Because so you're, you're off that wheel. Stop that. Less pressure. You can watch. You can monitor. You can go and watch people. You can go and talk to people. And even though I've, you know, I've, I've, I've still had to make a living from doing what I've been doing and stuff. But, you know, it's been refreshing. Because your knowledge bank is going like this. And the biggest thing what I'd say is, is you know, when it comes down to coaching, some coaches might not have the best knowledge, but they're bloody good at working with people. And they're good at like getting the best out of people, even in the worst moments. You know, I've had times where, you know, I've probably not had the best things going on in my life at times, but you know what? Because of my love for the game, it, it's put that aside. And someone else who's been going through hell at the time, you'd help them get through stuff and they've become the most successful people in what they do. So it's it's the love of the game, it's the care, and it's what you're doing it for. Because if it's just pounds and pounds, you're never going to get better. The best coaches aren't the richest people, unless you're Pep. Yeah.
or Mourinho or what they've proved themselves. You look at their journeys, they've had to sacrifice so much, you know, so when it comes back down to coaching and, you know, back down probably to a lot of people who are going to be watching this at grassroots, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a grassroots coach and you do an hour a week, make that hour a week as like knowledgeable and informative and enjoyable as you can because you'll get so much more out of it, you know, it's, um, it's about learning, it's about growing, it's about getting better and go back to what we were speaking about before, you know, 3v3 is probably encouraged more at the younger years but I think it's imperative throughout at some point every player gets to play it without being stopped just play yeah no there was one on the session I seen recently and it must be like every three minutes everyone stop let me you know talk and I'm like just let him play let him make that mistake pull that one kid to one side have the, the word with him that you would need to <laughs> and just, just let, let them play. You know, it's not about you as a coach. You know, they, they say about referees, you know, the best referees are the ones you don't see. Yeah. And it's like, oh, sometimes that's the coach. Yeah, yeah. Just let them play. You've done your work. Yeah, let them, let them play. I think a big thing is for like, say, grassroots clubs. And this is something I'm sure which you could do in one of your other ventures, what you do, is like, record yourself during a match. Yeah. Because when they're on that pitch, everything what you're trying to get into them. You've got to think, to, for, for every player to get the best amount, best experience of learning, they all learn differently. So in a session, you can't just do it one way. It's a way, not the way. And, and you know, big thing is the board. I used to be a bit thingy over the board because, I'll be honest with you, when I was younger, I probably didn't have the confidence, the tactical knowledge to get the board out and start to like really understand what was going on. You know, and, and with like the kids, how I got, I remember one group I had, I won't say where it was at, but this group were lively. These kids were lively, yeah. They were, they were tough kids, but they were good footballers, but maybe a little bit ahead of themselves at times. And, and it was like how you engaged them was really important. Start the session. If you did something where it was slow and it was monotonous and it was stop, start, you carry it, on, it, it, it just went through the session then. Whereas if it started and it's like high intense, competitive, yeah, some groups, there's always got to be a winner because that's what they thrive on, yeah. Some groups, it's around giving them as many touches on the ball as you can. For some groups, it's around challenges, love challenges. So the best coaches don't always stop the sessions. They walk around the sessions and they give each kid a little challenge. Well, there's nothing better when, you know, it's like anything in life in a job. Your boss pulls you in on your own. Look, you're doing fantastic. Can you just think about doing this, this and this? You're walking out like Conor McGregor, aren't you? Like, do you know what? Appreciate that. Probably go home and tell your missus or if you're a kid, you're a teacher, you're going to go and tell your parents. And it's no different for like when these kids are being coached. It's how you get that information across. You know, like like these boards here, which is from Mike, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> these boards here, I used to put the faces of the players on the magnets. So when you're talking, you're going... You know, Joel Bloggs is probably picking his nose and scratching his backside sometimes, or he's freezing at that time. You know, it actually draws him to be engaged because he knows he's talking about you. There was one thing, and a lesson I learned, and he was off, and he's not a coach, this guy. A good friend of mine, he started helping me out with the women's team, and he brought tactics board. And he, he, he's a good guy, and he went and bought this, this offline. He rocks up one day, he says, what are you doing? I went... They've never played football before, most of these women. So they don't need tactics. They went, not tactics, it's a visual aid. Yeah, and I went, so. mate, honestly, I for years, especially with the young group, never used a tactics board. I'm thinking, they don't need to know tactics mm. at that age. I, what is that? Oh, like that, you know, yeah. It's a visual aid. You see them now, like say, with the images on or the numbers on. Well, the best one, like, that's you there. The best one like, was, wow, yeah. like, for me, I remember one group, and uh, it was like a female group where instead of using the tactics board, I actually made them the tactics board. So I'd stand them up on a, put four cones down as a pitch and I'd move them on the board, stood up. So they're actually actively on the pitch, if that makes sense. Yes. Cause some of them will get it like that. Some of them, you just say it, they'll get it. Some of them, you tell them on the pitch, they'll understand it. Some of them, you've got to do it three, four different ways before it sinks in. But if you're just delivering it one way, you know, doesn't mean it's going to go through and then you know, you wonder why some coaches then are constantly talking. 
you're like, it's because they're getting frustrated because what they've got in their head, they can't get it across so they have a clear, like clarity, understanding of what's going on. Um, example for me, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, I took a group away on a tour, um, great group of players. When you go abroad, it's on the year. So it's instead of England, it's September to uh, July. It's January to December. And, and this group, what we took, we had one lad and he was like, he was a problem solver. So he was good. Streetwise kid, scouse kid, you know, could think on his feet, could hold his own. You know, people give him a bit. He's not scared to give it back. And it was like trying to make his game more simpler because he used to work so hard at times. He was using excessive energy. He was running around into other areas other people's areas of the pitch and we tried to get a balance between him thinking for himself but then also having boundaries of in this area start thinking about this in this area start thinking about that and that was through small sided games just because it was 4v4 5v5s so it's more around like being a team player so you can't do it on your own you're in a team if there's two of you there against one it's more powerful than you being 1v1 use it to your advantage either give him the ball or pretend to give him the ball, you know, so you can stay on the ball. And uh, same thing, tournament, it's packed, this pitch. And I'm like, oh, come on, and we've overachieved. Because we had, we had like minimal amount of players. People are carrying dead legs, bruises. You've done five games in a day. I'm knackered. God knows what the players were like. And we're still trying to like GMO. Um, and this kid's half ignored me. Right, I've gone, set the ball, set the ball, set the ball, set the ball. And he's ignored me, and he's bloody ignored me. You know, next thing he's turned, we're playing, I remember it was one of the top Spanish teams, and he's met this kid, and he's chipped the goalie. Now, you got to remember that some of these kids, just clever, <coughs> very clever. We underestimate them, that they can solve problems better than us sometimes, but emotion can get in the way. Yeah. So when it's like 3v3, the frantic transition, bam, 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 attack, defend, run, pass. Or if it's a short time period, it's like whoever scores the first goal, the first couple of goals, that's that's the win, isn't it? So obviously it's about development and you have to come back to development, development, development with the younger ones. I don't care what anyone says, I'll argue that and toss all day of the week. You've got to have a winning mentality, but you've also got to be brave enough to try and do things, educate in the right areas of the pitch, yeah? So he scores his goal. So at the end of it, I'm going, I've just learnt the biggest thing probably in my coaching career in years now that you know more than me sometimes. No, not that you know more than me, but you've got a better idea to solve the problem than me. Because he's used his initiative, he's been reactive, scored this goal, and I'm going, that was 10 times, 10 times more creative, effective than what I thought. So go back to what I said about coaches when you're coaching. Just listen to where you're talking. I, I did it to myself last year, so coaching the Red Star last year, we got the, the real camera, you know, and uh, I always stood underneath it, and it was for that, for me to, at, at the end yeah, of the game, yeah, yeah. to listen to what I said yeah. and how, how I said it. And you watch, because in the game, you're thinking, oh, this is all going perfect, or this is all going rubbish. You're that caught up in the emotion, I'm still, still learning. So watching it back and hearing what I'm saying going, why have I said that there? I'm not a big shower anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I do, you know, still like in, in, in with my older older team, is just let them play. Yeah. Let them go and make that decision. You know, I say, yeah, I'll trust them. If I've done my job right when we're training, they'll, they'll make the right decision. I'll learn about it on, on, in the game. But I, I still listen to myself of what I said, and I always made sure I stood under, under the camera. So when you could see me, me bald head at the back. Yeah. <laughs> um, but more, more for that. So I, could, I, could listen to myself. I, I think a big thing though is is you know how how do you want someone to talk to you because I don't react well if someone's screaming in my face and I certainly don't react well if someone's like probably dictating to me what to do because when you've been doing something so long you've got experience and you've got knowledge and but I'll always debate and listen and learn and you know but but go back to like the best coaches I've seen, like Steve Holland now, he's the assistant England manager, right? Um, I had Steve at Crew for years. Crew never, uh, Steve never spoke louder than this, even when you're on the other side of the pitch. Dead calm, dead collective. But his knowledge, 
commanded respect. Because you know if you didn't listen to him, that little bit could be the difference between you being a top player and an all right player. Whereas some players, you know, they might need a bit of a rocket every now and again. We all need that, don't we? On the pitch, you're a bit tired, so much gone wrong, you know. True for it sometimes, but remember it's about development and I think some people do it in the right way where when they communicate and they might be quite aggressive, it's because they want the best for the player as well as the result. But then, you know, I think commanding respect by having good knowledge, having clarity in your information, the way you articulate what you're saying is massive, is more powerful than someone ranting and raving on the side of the pitch because I think it shows a bit more class as a person, sportsmanship. It shows, you know, think about things more logically. You know, if, you, if you're at that point where it's red mist, you ain't thinking about much other than this little bit. If you're calm, you can assess, you can see what's going on. And some of the best managers, like I watch the Prem, and some people go, "Why is he not on the? Why is he not on the sideline?" As if that's oh yeah, he's, he's more passionate if he's up shouting and screaming. Like, right? but do you know what? Analyzing, analyzing, analyzing. It's mad. You never see him. I mean, it was Sam Allardyce, wasn't it? And he always gets slated off for the things he does. But he'd sit in the sand, wouldn't he? For for years and years. Years game, yeah. yeah. And you don't see anyone doing that now. You know, just watch it. I know they've got probably other yeah, people up there yeah, yeah. doing technology yeah. yeah. now, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, you, and you see that, but yeah, watching back to that, you know, reviewing the games, seeing them what what I I did, did I do anything to affect that game positive or, or negative way? And you do, you just got to like say learn from that. I, I like I speak to people all over the world about technical programs, you know, um, different different methods of developing players, different ways of developing coaches, not because. I'm an expert in it, but do you know what? I've spent 17 years like on a board with a ball at my feet, on a pitch. It's what I know. And and you know, I will say this like so Dario Grady for me was the best person I developed off because he was blunt, mate. Like, Why are you doing this? Stop doing that. His his communication at times was ruthless. But do you know what? Just simplify the game, mate. The game doesn't have to be complicated. You know, everyone talks about tick attack and, you know, this, that and the other. It's possession. It's how you keep the ball. Now, how you keep the ball and what you want players to do when they keep the ball or how you want them to receive the ball or what you want the body shape to be like. That's how articulate that person is and how much understanding they have and how meticulous they are in the minor details, going back to like you said before, the stuff what I try and deliver or share to people is, you've got to think in them depths. You think of them depths and you get the place to think in them depths. You're unstoppable. You know, the team we had at City, under like myself, Mick Cush and Al Mann, when we like did the Conti Cup WSL for like two years in a row, we didn't have the biggest budget in the league, but do you know what we had? We had a solid group of players who, do you know all of them, they knew how to receive the ball, the ball in certain areas of the pitch. They knew what to do in certain areas of the pitch. They knew in this, this, this when this action happened or when this mistake happened, how to react, how to adapt. And you know what? The coaches and the players were together, mate. You never seen arguments. You seen you seen the odd like handbags of like. I don't mean that in a thingy way. Handbags as in oh, you know because the win. But you see the bit of like every now and again they'd get a bit you know. They'd, they'd get a bit fiery because they want to win in training, which is natural, you know. But when they crossed the white line and went in the canteen, it's forgotten about respect, laughing and joking. So, environment's massive, you know. Um, the best players want to practice, the best players want repetition. I think there's nothing worse when, you know, players are stood on a pitch and you can see him freezing. You know, big thing for me, massive thing for me. If I'm going to say anything is, what I learn, team talks, yeah? So you talk for 10 minutes about 50 different things. Nothing sinks in. Nothing. You know, I was speaking with Flynn the other day. He's in the back of the room, huh? Say hi. Right. <laughs> you don't want to see him, he's ugly. Right. Um, 
and we're talking about like what do you think about before you play and uh, he said well I don't know well each player give them like an individual thing to attack in the game so that's the own challenge for everyone it could be in the ball without the ball it could be psychological you know keep your stuff together I'm just going there. keep your stuff together um, it could be being more of a team player whatever that is but then the key bit is when you're talking to the team about the team just three points just keep it simple you know always start on a positive always start on a positive you know get whatever you need to go out which is a development area not a negative and end on a positive because remember the people no one likes to be told off do they I don't care how old you are no everyone, you know, everyone likes to be praised um, or to be helped and it's the same you know you can say that same thing in a negative or a positive way or it's just a well you know whether it's a question you ask or you know, you shout at someone change your tone of voice yeah. change it from a statement to a question same message but just get it get it across in it in a different way especially say with the younger ones they're not into they don't need you know 10 minutes tactics like big thing now is, is like for coaches and for players is look how accessible information is look how how passionate some people are who've got instagram pages you know there's people who you know some great people and i, I am quite wary who, who she has stuff with and who i talk to because it comes down to level again and, and also you could have someone who's got a million followers on online and they want to share information but it's what their their gain is from it is it because they're really passionate or is it financial and for me i'm all for giving my time to people who give back you know, like I've done with the strong heart stuff is give a lot of my time up because these these lads and women just needed a bit of guidance. It cost nothing. And the also the other thing is if you're the most knowledgeable person in the world, you're never gonna become more knowledgeable unless you share. So you've got to talk, you've got to network with people and, and, and I think you figure out along the way who knows what they're doing and who done, you know, who's trying, who needs a bit more like upskill. But you've got to have that drive as a person to develop yourself. Because if you don't develop yourself, why are the players going and practice in the garden? Well, I wouldn't, you know, practice what you preach. You know, you know. at the end of the day, you're a role model. You, some people don't realise that. You know, I didn't realise how much Ruben's coach is. He looks up to him. You know, I'll say, come and have a drink. He goes, no, uh, Gary or Matt won't let me. Why? He says, because I've got to listen to information. I went, do you know what? You're right. Me being the dad. You know, and that's me, someone who's done it a long time, going, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what, mate? So, all right, son, go on. Forgot about that one. But it's a good game, isn't it? And, and, you know, I think what's important is play as much as you can, practice as much as you can if you're a player, if you're a coach, you know, be a role model. You know, when, you, when you've got them players around you, you can change their lives. It sounds mad for a born for you coach, you can change their lives. People from, can forget about some of the hard lives and the hardships up they have. Some kids, it's just something what keeps them ticking every day of the week. Some people, for me, I don't know what I'd do without football, I'll tell you that now. God, yeah, what, what would we be doing? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Genuinely, I don't know. Mm. No, it's, it's been, a, been a, a good, a great, great you know, way to, to make a living is working in football and people, my wife goes, why are you on the phone at that time and doing seven days a week? Like, it's, it's, not, it's not a job. Yeah. I'm going to get to talk to people like you, coaches, you know, people like at all different clubs around the country, around around the world at the minute, with, with Bazooka Gold, yeah. with some of the projects we've got going on, and it's like, yeah, just great to, you know, talk football. And stuff like this is great, mate, because you know what, sharing knowledge, it's um, for people who really do want to get better, taking that time to listen and watch and learn, it's important, I still do it now. You know, I'll drive to the other side of the country. I'll do Zoom calls, conference calls with groups of coaches and we'll talk tactically about a certain area. Or a big thing, what a lot of people come to me is talking about the technical side of what's relevant, you know, what things do you really start to home in on. And it's just sharing, you know. If you come too precious, no one's ever going to help you. So it's life, that, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's like, I can be on top of the world at one point, but then... We all get stuck at some point, you know, and it's it's the more people you've got to lean on and the people who who you trust and who you 
people you look up to in different ways. Do you know what I mean? Look up to someone doesn't mean that they're a messiah in football. It could be someone who's just really good at articulating how they get information across. You know, one teacher really like changed the way I delivered my football coaching mm. and stuff. I mean, you talk too much because it might be up and like I could stem so rabbiting off. It's like just take a minute, process what's going on. Now that's because I'm honest and I can handle my heart. Go, Jesus Christ, no, you don't shut up. But sometimes people have better ideas than what you're saying. So it's no, I do. I, I love like, like listening to you, listen to other like podcasts that are out there, and and I say I'm a, a visual learner, um, so I love got to watch, you know, people's sessions, and I say when I've been down and, and seen yours and it's how you interacted them with with the individual players. Yeah. It one, you said it before. You don't treat everyone exactly the same. Mm. Um, it was how you how you dealt with each each individual. Some needs that little arm round them. Yeah. Some needs that little joke. Some needs that you know, come on, bit of a bit of a push. Some of them need more than a push, mate. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I uh, no, and I say I, I the stuff I've seen you you share. I say I've, I've picked up a lot um, over the years. So so thanks for that, and that's why I've. I've always uh, when I can helped you out when I can. Oh, so my my, uh, my next little gift. Yeah, so oh, stop it. Oh yeah, stop it. <laughs> hey, 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 get that oil. <laughs> get that WD forty for us, will you? <laughs> so on behalf of Bazooka Goal, uh, I know you're a, you're a big fan of playing football tennis. Yeah. Uh, I'm just got to play football tennis. I've got to play football tennis. I'll ring, I'll ring you back. Uh, so I thought, right, you can have your very own. In a bag, you now play, play, play anywhere. So that's Thank you, you then. Mate. Cheers, buddy. So Thank you. Hopefully, Thank you, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that. So just then on that then, and, and this then as, as one of our products and as a game. So you, you play it. Are you what? Your week left? Yeah, I play it every yeah. week, three, four times a week. Play. Yeah. So how I get my how I get my spends, mate. It's just taking the money off the players. <laughs> 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 right, we'll get a little book, get a little book going. Get a video out. Um, but yeah, just as, as a game, I, we take that around. I let kids play it at like the, the sideshow yeah. almost, but having it as oh, it's part of the game during lockdown, me and my lad, you know, I was smashing him the first few weeks. After that, he figured out, right, I know what he's got to do now. Yeah. And just his touch, yeah, where, where he's, he's it's amazing, the ball. Mate. It's amazing because, like, I started it off, well, I started seeing it. So when, when the Spanish started coming into City, um, they were always playing it, always. And, you know, like, we used to play head tennis on a volleyball pitch at crew. You play like 5v5, but come down to touches. You, you're getting the odd touch every now and again. So for me, it was um, when when lockdown, lockdown to be fair, and you know, was getting on the field, training myself. You know, I think everyone felt a bit trapped at some point, didn't they? You know, and mentally, you know, I'm a doer. I need to be out. Um, and so many players needed to be out as well. And then... We were getting like sellotape or string and tying it to poles, and it was effective and it worked, you know. And it's that you know we, we have some great great products and and they're, they're, they're expensive for some. Mm. Um, and it was back when I had my first conversation with, with Sturge at the FA. It was like, you know, my job is to try and promote the three v three air pitches. I but to play three v three, you need four cones and a ball. Yeah, of course, I said anyone can play. I said that's my love first. Everything else, yeah. yeah, comes after it. I think what's important thing, though is yeah. like with stuff like an actual net, you know, it's a visual and it prevents cheating. So it's not <laughs> like, oh, no, it's gone, it's gone over, it's gone yeah. over. What do you mean it's gone under? Wait, it's my point. You know, like, like 20 minutes of yeah. that. Now, if there's like a bacon butter at the end of it, or, you know, there's a brew on the end or a hot chocolate or Costa, you go, no, oh, no, it's my point. And because you've got no lines on the pitch as well. It's like, oh, it's in, it's in, it's in. You know, you'd always get the odd one like me, like say, like it's compare. Like Flindos, like I go, whoa, whoa, it's our ball. What do you mean? Look, look. So even put a dent in the grass, and he'll look there, and I go like that. See, what's that there? Like that, because you know why? It's competitive, isn't it? No, but the key bit for me is it's also a tactical game, which needs high level technical actions. Which you know, it's like when you're serving the ball, you know, for a lot of like players, because they are so predominant on one side. You just you know, it becomes a tactical game where like I remember. At City, we used to play it with the old five-a-side net, you know, like the big yeah, long yeah, nets. Yeah. But the issue I had is one side of the net had the things in, mm. and the old, experienced guy would go, "Oh, I want the other side." 
because all they do is keep dropping it in the net. You're like, what? That's not a point. Yeah, it is. Well, you wanted that side. You know, or what we used to do is to try and mix the game up. We'd play it in a sports zone. We'd play it where, like, you'd have a corner. So the net would be against the wall, but you could play off the corner like squash. Mm -hmm. Now, if you got that end, you ain't winning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you enjoyed playing the game. So it's how you vary it. So for me, you can also get a good technical focus of improving players by playing head tennis, by setting them challenges. You might be able to, like for defenders, you know, do a higher net. Raise your net higher. Extends yeah. up. So there you go, raise a higher net. See, I've done a bit of research. <laughs> yeah. And you can only head it across. Because, you know, how much heading do you really get to do? Now, the younger ones, you probably wouldn't say that. You know, um, it might be for strikers, right? You've got to go, before it comes across, it can't bounce. It's a tight pitch. It's chest and it goes across. You know, you, you can manipulate it to get what you want. But I think the key bit is, it comes down to preparation before you get the ball. Knowing how to manipulate your, your opponent, um, and it's, it's it's a laugh, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's that when when you break it down and, and you put all of, like so those ta tactical and technical elements into that, you go, you know, yeah, you know what, we can. There's there's probably twenty things easy. I play not of a lie, so I will say this. So Jill Scott, one day over lockdown, come on, let's have a kick about. All right, let's go. So we're on a field, yeah. We're on a field running. We had these two sticks, bit of tape, set tennis up. I was only meant to be on there for an hour, you know. Two and a half hours going at it, you know. No, 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 play again, play again, play again, play again. Because the thing is, it's that winning mentality again. It comes into that, you know, you, you, it's football and you're working on specific actions of football. But then it's that mindset again. It's that psychological corner, what you're hitting in it. Resilience when you're losing, you know, are you keeping your cool when someone's smashing you because you're having a bit of a bad day or it's windy on your side so the ball's coming at 100 miles an hour? How do you react? So, you know, stuff like this, stuff like the goals, stuff like the 3v3 pitches, the training aids, and yeah, you can recreate them, but it's about quality and also having something what's a lot more robust, you know, when it does get competitive and a bit argy bargy, you know, it's not going to snap, is it? You know, and that's the other bit for me is like, if you've got good equipment, then at the end of the day, you know, you've always got something which you know is going to be with you, which you can always fall back onto if you need to work on that area. If you've got that net in your van or if you've got it at home, you know, would well, you know what? It's first touch was shocking at the weekend. Instead of being obvious within training, right, you come here, I just want you to work on this, where he probably feels like, I know it wasn't great. Well, you might set a head tennis up at the start of the session just for him, but everyone else loves it because you know why? It's hidden learning and you're actually attacking that player without singling him out, you know. So it comes down to coaching again, you know. And, and, and it's about a word we say we use it loads of time now repetition, you know. Yeah. Like you say, in an hour, you're probably getting what, two, three hundred touches mm -hmm. easy. Oh, um, a little sideways movements, and I love. There's a kid who, who played for me a few years back and he'd come to football from tennis and his balance and his movement and, yeah. his, and his first yard speed was just unbelievable. And it was all that and it was like, you know, he's not stood there, he's not in a straight line, everything's, you know, side to side. And it's, yeah, he's, he was just a... I remember, I, I, so, so one thing what I've been really lucky to do is, through my time at the clubs and where I've worked, is travel, go abroad and, and actually spend time, good quality time, weeks, maybe the odd month here and there, um, watching what other clubs do in their programmes and the methodology, how they work. And, you know, you, it sounds crazy this, but different countries, different parts of the countries have different mentalities, what they try and incorporate into developing into players. And, and you look at some defenders, say, in England now, you go back 15 years ago, we were aggressive, we were ball winners. You know, you were adding the ball, you go back to like people with their bandages on their head and blood coming out, you know, cotton, butt, cotton wool up the nose because someone's elbowed him. The game's changed. So the way the game's changed is psychologically you have to change, but then also technically, tactically, physically, it's a different game now. So, you know, you've got to be aggressive in different ways. 
Now, instead of being aggressive to win the ball back, it might be aggressive when you're getting the ball in your actions. So, like, heading. Like, I went and watched um, this session in, in Belgium. And, uh, you know, this coach is unbelievable now. He's a first-team coach at Genk. And he, was, he had Kevin De Bruyne for years at Genk, Lukaku, you know, and a few others. You know, he's dealt with, with the Belgian national teams and stuff. And they're teaching the boys to head the ball. But when they're heading it, it's like, it's like they're headbutting someone, you know. It's like they're so aggressive and powerful in what they're doing. Whereas we're a bit more like it's more of a pass, you know, or we're trying to be like more precise and guide the ball into the net. They're like, boom, you know. And it's little things and little bits what you emphasise on when you're doing, say, head tennis or a variety of games to get different stuff, which give you different outcomes. And, and it's just having an open mind again, isn't it? Is and for, for me, it's always down to having fun then as well. Is making all your sessions fun, and whether it's a foot tennis or I'm just playing a little one v one with a little bazooka nets, and, and you're playing pano. You know, there's a company down south and they do pano all yeah, the time, yeah? yeah. And the kids love it. All right, we, we tried up here and like parents, like, well, that's not real football. Yeah. Like, it's not eleven v eleven mm. all the time. It's one v one. It's, yeah, you know, let the kids go and I say, express themselves, think, you know, quick on the feet, you know, what, what can they do? In a game, yeah, they might do it once a month, right? but let them go and enjoy it, let them express, let them, you know, especially with academy kids, I see a lot of them, it's all structured and, you know, they've got to do this, that, 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 and the other, yeah, it's a process. Whereas right, some sides, like, they come to us, and it's like, just go and play, go and enjoy it, bang the music on, let them play, let them mess up, right, without the fear of, of you know, Coach is watching and going to tell me off. Uh, and it's it's that my my level of technical and tactical is, is way below a lot of coaches, but I know how to create a, a fun environment. Do you know what though? If you, if you love what you do, you want to get better, don't you? And, and you know, it, it's it's a balance between, you know, it's like a gauge. If you're at a club, like some some grassroots clubs train twice a week. You know, some private academies have kids in three four times a week. Now, what I'd say is 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 You've got to gauge how much pressure, what you're doing, how much, you know, uh, what's the intensity. The intensity can be put in different ways, different capacities. So intensity of running, intensity of transitions, intensity of failure. Because you can do games where you know the ball's just going to get turned over and over and over. And it's reactions, are, which then also knocks on to resilience, which knocks on to how much heart do you have, you know. Um, you can also, like have fun but you can disguise that you know what the kids love doing play matches now how many times do kids get to pick the teams you know how many times do you mix the teams up so you know certain players who might not get as much success week in week out get success you know um have you always put the big ones with the big ones and the little ones with the little ones you know have you put all the left foots together you know have you put all the defenders as a team all the midfielders, all the goalies. I've seen that with the goalies have smashed, smashed, smashed players at 4v4s. And you know why? Because they're brave. They're like putting the bodies on the line, trying over head kicks. I'm like, whoa, 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 we're playing tomorrow. We've got a game tomorrow. What are you doing? The goalie comes to going, Mark, get them off there. I'm like, no, they're the best players. Like, do you know what I mean? And the, bless them, they're still in the goalie gloves. They're still like this. But at the end of the day, you know, you've got to think out of the box. And the more you think out of the box, and what I've always tried to do is, you know, I see a million people sharing stuff. You know, half the time, it, it's, it, it's, I see something and it inspires me to think about something else. Now, having different formats, having different ways of training, you know, me and you can deliver something, but we could deliver it 10 different ways. It's how black and white you are, you know, comes down to that magic of how open mind and how creative your brain is. Because players love to do things which, A, they get a little bit of success from, but then also they can see themselves getting better. And um, I think, you know, it's about being a good person as well, isn't it? You know, someone's shouting at you, you're probably not going to get the best outcome. Someone's putting their arm around you, talking to you, spending time with you, talking to you at the right moments, talking to you in the right frame of mind. You, 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 you're going to warm to them because they know they want to get the best out of you. And uh, it's a funny old game, isn't it? As they say, no, it is, it's been great, and uh, I'm going to wrap it up here, Mark, because yeah. I know well, our phone bills sometimes say, yeah, we can talk talk for hours. Uh, but no, appreciate your, your time today. Uh, love, love listening to you. Hopefully people have, 
I picked one thing up, two yeah. things up out of that, yeah. um, that they can go away and, and change it. They can message you yeah. if they've got any, any questions. It's not, it's not just two dodgy monks just sat on a set talking about <laughs> yeah. ball, isn't there? With a peacock in the background. Yeah. Yeah, but anyone who anyone wants to get in touch with me, you know, most people get in touch with me via Instagram. Um, so my Instagram's Reese eight five eight zero, and obviously, you know, speak closer to the mic and the bazooka guys and the three v threes to try and help them as much as possible. But you know, key bit is just keep looking to improve, keep looking to be the best you can be, enjoy it. It's not always going to go your own way, whether you're coaching, you're managing, you're playing. And it's just being about resilient and learning from your mistakes and and do that. What will be will be. Can't try any harder than that, can you? There is a word I, I've learned this years ago called ka, it's called ka, kaizen, and it's a Japanese um, philosopher, and it's just a constant and never-ending improvement, and that that's what it stands for. And say whether it's it's football, being a dad, being a business owner, yeah, it's uh, it's just something that yeah always keeps pushing me and pushing me onto. To be better then. So, quick five questions. Favorite player? Phil Foden. Most skillful player you coached? Most skillful. Bursan Salina. Plays for Swansea. Mm -hmm. um, and your favorite free, if you're making a 3v3 team now, we got a 3v3 World Cup coming up. You can pick any three players from current or, or in the past. Who are you having? I can't play them, I'll be taken. Right, uh, yeah. Um, Phil Foden. Um, got to be careful here because the amount of women and female players, so we're going to have to bounce it out. You know what? Right. Yeah, because I, right. I, I said this to with that, uh, so we, we've been very uh, male orientated with our, our, our interviews. Yeah, I mean, but, getting but some women. Some, there's some involved. top, 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 top female players, so I'd go Carly Lloyd because of work rate, a passion, a desire. Uh, Phil for his creativity. I'm gonna get done on this, you know, for not mentioning <laughs> people there. Um, Leo Messi, isn't it? Yeah. Leo Messi. Uh, he's in. He's in a few few squads. Know, few squads. That's so I've got it. So. Male, female, upcoming player. That's the way I've done it. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, I'll say, Mark, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure, mate. I say, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Top Tune man. in next week for the the next edition of. Uh, Friday Tactics Board, sponsored by Bazooka Gold. Cheers now.